Let's pray together. Father, the confession of our lips and the posture of our heart, I pray, would be one of humble recognition that if anything in this room is going to happen that will have any real lasting value, God, you're going to have to come and do it. God, our minds drift off in distraction. Our hearts um, are harder and more full of idolatry than we care to admit. And so, we need your help. Because we do not want to waste moments like this where we gather as your church to sit under your word. And so God, would you cause by your spirit, before we even get into your word, a humble dependence from us upon you to do the thing that your word promises that it will do, to not return void, to accomplish its purpose. So God, would you do that in our hearts? And then would you accomplish that purpose through your word? And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We are... Working our way through the book of Hebrews, a reminder that the book of Hebrews is a, essentially a sermon that was meant to be read in the hearing of a church. Uh, we don't know a ton about the church, but we do know that the church was um, a group of uh, Jewish Christians. That is to say, a group of Jews who had left Judaism and the dead religion of Judaism and come over to follow Jesus. And as you read your way through the letter, you are uh, reminded of the pervasive nature of, uh, of, of, of going back to the thing that is familiar. This is the human condition. And these Jews have um, believed upon Jesus, but, uh, but a life with Jesus is difficult. And they are finding that out. They have, as it were, a front row seat to that reality that a life with Jesus is difficult. And, and in the difficulty, there's perhaps a, a pull in them to go back to what's familiar and to go back to what is easy. And so it's important that we keep in mind that Hebrews chapter 11 uh, is actually the outworking illustration of what comes previously in chapter 10, at the end of chapter 10, which is another call to endurance. The, the preacher, the pastor, is calling his uh, flock to endurance, to uh, perseverance. And he essentially says to them, by way of quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2, that the way in which perseverance, the way in which we make it to the end as believers in Jesus Christ, the way in which that happens is by faith. And he expresses his confidence in verse 39 of chapter 10 by saying of, of himself and of his church, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith who walk by faith, who live by faith, verse 38, and preserve their souls. And then chapter 11 flows out of that, and chapter 11 is the, it's an illustration. So uh, uh, preaching, it will at times make a point and then illustrate the point. That's what an illustration is. It's to help drive the point home. And Hebrews chapter 11 is the illustration. It is a very, very familiar reminder to the people of God, these, these 
um, Jewish Christians of those who have gone before. But the point of the illustration is not for you to walk away and go, Abel's awesome, Noah's awesome, uh, Moses is awesome. That is not the point. And it's unfortunate that so much of the, the preaching around Hebrews chapter 11 has meant to put forward for you these so-called heroes, which you can, I suppose, call them that if you want to, so long as you understand that the actual point of Hebrews chapter 11 is to see the necessity of faith and to realize that there is no perseverance and no making it to the end, um, which is to say getting to heaven um, apart from faith. Faith is the central piece of the Christian life. We are saved by faith and we live by faith. And that's the point of, of, of what our preacher is saying in chapter 11. So what he's going to do then is he's going to point out some names that his audience would have been very familiar with and he's going to illustrate how faith works in their lives and thus do that to commend faith to his church and by extension to us. It's very important that you keep that in mind. And so what we'll see this morning as we look at this is we'll see that living by faith is going to have these three components to it that will be made very, very clear in the lives of Abel, Enoch, and uh, Noah. Living by faith means that you come to God by faith, that you walk with God by faith, and that you obey God by faith. You'll see that play out, that we come to God by faith, that we walk with God by faith, and that we obey God by faith. That is what living by faith and thus persevering to the end will look like in our lives. And he illustrates that by taking us first to Abel. And I'm in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Through which, through that offering, through which he, that is Abel, was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now, there are some of us in this room, and I'm aware of this, and so are you. There are some of us in this room who know exactly what the preacher is talking about. Oh, yeah, Abel and Cain. I've heard of, I, I know exactly that story. You might have grown up around a flannel graph, and so you have the picture in your mind, and you're very, very familiar with it. Others of us, like you might have heard of Cain and Abel, but you don't really have any idea. And either way, whether you are very familiar or unfamiliar, I don't want to assume familiarity. The problem with that is, is that not all of you um, understand that or even view that rightly, even if you're familiar familiar with it. And sometimes it's the familiar things in the Bible that have the most profound meaning to them. And yet because of our familiarity, we're like, oh yeah, I get that. Moving on to the next thing. And so we just aren't going to do that. We just don't do that around here and we're not going to do it today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to turn back to Genesis with me and we're going to read this and we're going to see exactly what our preacher means for us to see. And so uh, Genesis chapter 4 is where we'll be, and we'll have the, the, the Hebrews text on the screens as a reference, at least I, I hope we will as I say that, um, yes, excellent, uh, and so we'll have those on the screens as a reference so we can go back and forth, I'm going to go back and forth in my Bible, um, you can too, but, but this way we're going to really um, keep at the forefront of our minds what's really going on. Now I want to remind you that, that two brothers bring offerings to God. One brother's name is um, Cain and the other is Abel. Cain is the older, Abel the younger. And they both bring offerings. And one of their offerings is accepted, according to the preacher um, in, in Hebrews, and the other is not. Now, I, wanna, I want us to understand, or, or at least ask the question, why is it that Abel's offering is more acceptable than Cain's? That's what we have to figure out, because that's really important. Why is it that Abel's offering is accepted and Cain's is not? You all could also ask, why is it that Abel is accepted and Cain is not? Because the offerings are a reflection of, of the men. One of their offerings is accepted, therefore the man is accepted. The others is rejected, therefore the man is rejected. So let's keep that in our minds because we've got to figure that one out. Okay, uh, I'm in Genesis 4, so are you, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So he's the older, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Two brothers. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. 
And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. You could say accepted Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, verse 7, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Look at this, look at this um, illustration of sin here. Sin is crouching at the door like a monster ready to consume you. That's, the, that's the, the visual. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So two brothers bring two offerings. One is accepted, one is not. The question that we have to ask, because our preacher in Hebrews makes the distinction in 11.4 that, that, Cain's, uh, that Abel's offering is accepted, Cain's is not. Why? The first answer is, is very obvious um, and, and very evident and very true, and it is this. Because Abel brings his offering by way of faith, and Cain does not. That's the whole point. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So, so the, 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 the initial reason that you see in the text very clearly that the preacher of the Hebrews is trying to drive home is Abel offers to God a more acceptable sacrifice because his sacrifice comes by way of faith. That was, that's where John Calvin landed on it. Is he said, we have basically no other reason in the text to conclude that, that um, Abel's offering was accepted other than the fact that he brought it by faith. And, and I agree with that. And it would be very difficult to not agree with that. But there are um, other uh, theologians and scholars, and I tend to find this a bit on the compelling side, that say, yes, it was because it was brought by faith primarily, but also the nature of the sacrifice itself. The nature of the sacrifice itself. And so Augustine basically said, as he looked at Cain and Abel, he looked at one of them as um, as, uh, uh, Cain as the... The, um, the, the religious, autonomous, self-righteous approach to God as contrasted with Abel, which was the, the um, approaching God by faith and in obedience to God. And so, so he's going to make a little more of it and squeeze a little more out of it than, than, than Calvin would. And so, so it kind of comes down to what you make of, of Genesis 3 and verse um, 22. So or I'm sorry, verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Depends on what you make of that. If you um, take from Genesis 3.21 that that right there is God establishing a pattern of how it is that sin and shame and guilt and nakedness are taken care of, which is, it seems to me as though what God is establishing there is that, so Adam and Eve sin, and what do they do to cover up their shame and their guilt and their nakedness? They go make clothes for themselves, and they make clothes for themselves out of fig leaves, and God rejects their attempt at cleaning themselves up, and instead God confronts them in their sin, and then God establishes for them that he, he, not them, he will need to be the one to get them out of the mess they've gotten themselves into. He's going to do that primarily by sending a serpent crusher who is going to reverse the curse and undo what's gone wrong. That's verse 15. And then in verse 21, it seems as though he is, um, he is emphasizing the, the, the nature of their inability to get themselves out of it again by going and getting animals. Now, in order to get an animal skin, you need to kill it. He could have like knitted them some clothes or something, or he could have created their clothes. That's not what he did. He went and got an animal and and killed it and took the skins and made a covering for their guilt and for their shame, which was evidenced by their nakedness. And so as you read, if you, if you understand verse 21 that way, and then you read through there that there was a time in the course of time, Cain and Abel, both at the same time, approached God at a, at a certain place. It seems as though, even though um, the Genesis account doesn't tell us that God says, come at this time and approach me in this way, it seems as though it's in there. Now, the reason that Calvin says, no, it's just faith, is because it's not in the text that God is saying, come at this time and come in this way, but it seems as though it's implied in there. 
It also appears as though when, when God says to Cain in verse 6, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? It seems as though God had made a standard for Cain and Abel to approach him. And, and, and the standard there is faith, but faith working itself out in approaching God on God's terms. And so if the, the um, pattern had been established that you approach God um, and, and, make, and, and make atonement for your sin by the blood of an animal and not the fruit of the ground, then, then as Abel approaches God by faith, he's approaching God by faith, yes, Calvin is right, and he's approaching God by faith in God's terms, which is to say by, by blood, not his blood, the blood of an animal. And it seems as though Cain is not approaching God by faith. That's evident in the Hebrews text, evident here in the Genesis text. But that, that Cain is rather approaching God his own, on his own terms. Like, yeah, God, I mean, the whole blood thing, like, it's weird. Like, I'll just bring you some, some fruit. Fruit is more pleasant to the eye. Killing things tends to be unpleasant. God, a little barbaric. I'll approach you on my terms. And so they both approach, one by faith, in obedience to God on God's terms, the other not by faith and on his own terms. And if you watch the way this plays out between the two brothers, one offering is accepted and thereby the brother is accepted, Abel, and the other offering is rejected and the brother also rejected, that's Cain. This does not make Cain very happy. As you notice in God's conversation with him, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? Repent. Come, come to me by faith on my terms. And Cain's response to that is in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that is yes. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God then explains to Cain what his punishment will be. He says, basically, Cain, you're cursed because of your disobedience and your lack of faith and you trying to approach me on your terms rather than mine. And Cain says, in the end of that, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And so the writer to the Hebrews pulls out this familiar story of Cain and Abel. And in the familiar story of Cain and Abel, he's illustrating to us the importance of approaching God by faith. Approaching God by faith on God's terms. You'll notice that, that, in, that even though Abel dies... It says um, in verse 4 of Hebrews 11, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel is dead, but he's still preaching. And the sermon he's preaching is, approach God by faith. Come to God by faith. Come to God by faith, not in your ability to, to bring an offering that will be accepted to God, but rather come to God on his terms, not yours. That's the sermon that he continues to preach. You could, say even it, you could even say it like this if you wanted to. Come to God not with the blood of a lamb, but the blood of the lamb Jesus, who according to our preacher in Hebrews 12, we'll get there a while from now, um, our preacher's not done referencing Abel. He, he talks in Hebrews 12 of Abel again, but he contrasts Abel with Jesus, and he says, yes, Abel's blood still speaks from the ground. And, and do you remember when, when God comes to Cain, he says what? Your, your brother's blood has, has come, come to my ears, right? Like your brother's blood, I've heard it crying up from the ground. What's Abel's blood saying? Abel's blood is crying out for justice, crying out for retribution. 
And, and, and so God gives um, justice to Cain, which is to curse him. That's what Cain deserved. But the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 12 tells us, but Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Not retribution, not justice on the guilty, which the guilty deserve. And, and it's true that Cain's punishment is, is right and more than he can bear. But rather, the blood of Jesus Christ says not retribution and justice, but rather forgiveness and no condemnation. We approach God not on the, um, based on the, on the blood of a, of a lamb, but rather on the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. That is the sermon that Abel's voice, his blood, still speaks even though he dies. Now I want you to think about this with me before we move on to Enoch. If you're in the congregation in the first century, these Hebrews, right? And you are, you've come to faith in Jesus and, and the pastor is encouraging you to continue to walk by faith. And, and, and it's difficult and it's hard, but you need to persevere. And then his first illustration of a guy is a guy you're very familiar of, familiar with, which is Abel. And in and, and, and the, the, the preacher is putting forth to you by way of, of an example of faith, Abel. And if you're a thinker on any level, you go, wait a second. Um, the first guy uh, ever to demonstrate the kind of faith that's being commended to me gets murdered, which is true. He gets murdered. The first guy to ever get to heaven is Abel. Like he's there kind of by himself. God's there, some angels. And he's there, and he's there because he obeyed God and got killed for it. Just think about that. I'm trying to be encouragement to you. And our preacher actually is trying to encourage his church. But you still have to wrestle with the fact that the first guy to demonstrate faith got killed for it. Okay, verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So Cain and Abel, pretty familiar. Enoch, probably not as familiar. So I'm jumping back again to Genesis. Enoch doesn't get a lot of verses in the Genesis account, but he gets a few of them. Genesis chapter 5. So, so we're going chronologically here. Abel first, then Enoch, then we'll finish out with Noah. So Genesis chapter 5, here's Enoch, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. After he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters, thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So that you understand what's going on there, Enoch is, is the illustration and the demonstration of walking by faith. And he walks with God by faith for 300 years. Now you have to remember, Enoch has no Bible. Enoch, the, the, the Garden of Eden shut down a while ago like some generations ago. So it's not like Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. That's not, Enoch, Enoch just has an, 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 the, the sort of relationship with God, the sort of level of spiritual intimacy with God that he walks with God for 300 years. And I want you to track with the picture of that. He wakes up in the morning and he walks with God in obedience. Um, J Jude is gonna help us understand that Enoch preached as he walked with God and he was condemning the unrighteous Righteousness in the land. You have to remember this is pre-flood. Okay, God's about to look down on the earth and go, "This, this, this thing is bad. Like unrighteousness everywhere. I'm going to just blow the place up and start over." God's about to do that. So this is the level of unrighteousness going on in the world. Enoch wakes up in the morning and he walks with God, and he walks with God with such a level of intimacy that he and God are like friends, and they walk together. And he wakes up and does it again, and they walk together. And as he walks, he preaches. 
And as he preaches, no doubt, the unrighteous world around him hates him and condemns him and all of those sort of things. And Enoch does this thing for 300 years. Wake up, walk with God, go to bed. Wake up, walk with God, go to bed. Wake up, walk with God, go to bed. Wake up, walk with God, don't go to bed because God just goes, come here. Like we have walked for so long, let's not walk down here anymore. Come here. Now, that might not strike you the way that it should yet. I want you to think about it for a while. And then I want you to notice a, a very interesting pattern that you see emerging in these, in these history lessons that the Bible gives us that we often skip over. I'm in Genesis 5, in verse 5. I hope you're there too. Let's look at it together. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he did what? He died. Verse 8. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he... Verse 14. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he... Verse 17. Thus all the days of Mah Mahalalel, that is exactly how you say it, by the way, were 895 years, and he... Verse 20. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he... Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Because Adam and Eve shattered the world and death came in the moment that they did. What is God doing with Enoch? He's interrupting things. He's demonstrating that while the wages of sin are death, which is why Adam died, and Kenan died, and Enosh died, and Methuselah is going to die, and death is going to go from Adam all the way down the line, God is demonstrating here, among other things, that he is not afraid to step in and interrupt things. Because what you're supposed to be struck by in these few verses with Enoch is, is that all the days of Enoch were 365 years, but Enoch walked with God. Or, or another way of saying that, he pleased God, and he was not, because God took him. He didn't die, God just said, come here. Wouldn't be the last time God did this. You remember Elijah, he's taken up, doesn't die, doesn't see death. So you got Enoch, you wait a while, you got Elijah, you wait a while, actually a really long time. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus demonstrates a power over death the world had not seen before in that there's this little girl who dies and he says, little girl, get up, and she gets up. And then there's this other guy who's his friend, Lazarus, and Lazarus dies and had been dead a while, and Jesus goes, hey, Lazarus, come out, and he does. And so, so you're, you're made aware of the fact that God can interrupt the order because he did it with Enoch, he did it with Elijah, and now here comes Jesus, and it seems as though Jesus can do the same sort of thing, only except Jesus dies. And then three days later, he's not dead anymore. By no small coincidence, God raises him up and says, come here. And then Paul looks back on that event and goes, he's the first fruits. He's, he's the first fruits of many brothers and sisters. Meaning that Enoch walks with God by faith, 
God says, come here, interrupts the order. Enoch doesn't need to fear death. Whether or not God had told him that was the plan, we're not sure. But he's just walking, and then God pulls him out. Elijah, same deal. Now, Jesus, unlike everybody who had ever lived before him, I should say like everybody who lived before him except for two people, Enoch and Elijah, Jesus dies. But unlike everybody who lived before him, he, that they all died for their sin because of their sin, because the wages of sin is death. Jesus will not die because of his sin. He's going to die because of ours. And then three days later, God's going to say, hey, son, get up. And then in that, that is meant to produce a hope in the people of God that God can interrupt death with Enoch, interrupt it again with Elijah. Jesus really interrupts the thing. And then now for us, we need not fear death, but rather we walk with God by faith. And then God says, come here. And while we still go through the valley of the shadow of death and there still is a sting to it, Paul looks back and says, but that sting of death will be removed one day in glory. So we approach God by faith. We see that with Abel. We walk with God by faith. We see that with Enoch. Now now you're feeling slightly more encouraged because Abel, yes, put his faith in God and got himself murdered for it by his brother. Enoch walks with God by faith and he doesn't, not only does he not get murdered, he doesn't even die. God pulls him out. Most of us are like, I'd rather trend on the Abel side, or I'm sorry, the, the Enoch side of things than the Abel side of things. But do you realize that in the landscape of redemptive history, it is bookended by those two right there? Meaning that some of us and this is true throughout redemptive history and you cannot argue with it, some of us walk by faith, approach God by faith, obey God by faith and get killed for it. We have been being slaughtered like sheep all day long, which is the normative experience of Christians throughout the generations. And some of us walk with God by faith and he pulls us out. You say, well, how do I get to pick? You don't. You don't. Somewhere between Enoch and Abel lies the most dangerous thing in my mind for the kingdom of darkness that exists within Christianity, and it's this. Throw us to lions, we'll sing hymns. We'll sing hymns. Because in the end, throwing us to lions transitions us out of this world and into the next. And we walked with God into the Colosseum, and he will walk us out. That is what makes Christianity so unstoppably beautiful. Is because the blood of the martyrs has been spilled throughout the centuries, and yet they live not for this city, but for the city that is to come. And like Jesus, for the joy set before them, endured the thing they were called to endure, and God comes for all of them in the end. Our preacher, as you might have noticed, is not interested in giving you a version of Christianity that does not exist. He's not interested in making it seem as though walking with God is some easy endeavor. It is not. And yet in the end, death does not get the last word. The king does. And then he brings us finally to probably our most familiar figure to this point in Hebrews chapter 11, Noah. Let me not skip verse 6. I almost did. Verse 6, and without faith, Hebrews 11, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I really need to speed up, so let me say this quickly. You'll notice that faith is not mentioned directly next to Enoch. Uh, well, by faith, Enoch. But then, but then it says, was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. In the Genesis account, the, the faith is not mentioned there, but our preacher is just going to help reinterpret that by saying, without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
The, the other way to render walking with God is to say that, that, that Enoch pleased God. And, and you cannot please God without faith. In other words, the thing that pleases God is not your righteousness because you don't have any. It's not your obedience because you have none of that apart from faith. The thing that pleases God, if God is pleased with you, if he's pleased with you, it's faith. It's faith in him, not, not a, a self-reliance. It's faith in him. Without faith, you cannot please God. So are there unbelievers in the world that do good things? Yes. Do any of those good things please God? No. Why? Because they're not done from faith. I just want you to see, because the writer of the Hebrews wants you to see how impossible it is to get ourselves out of this predicament apart from faith in God. You'll never do enough good things to, to please him. You'll never obey him enough to please him. He's pleased because of faith. That's it. And that comes clear here with Noah. Verse 7, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. This we find in Genesis chapter 6. So you've noticed by now we're working our way, the preacher is working his way chronologically with these illustrations. And he's going to pick up, well, we'll pick up next week, post-flood. But right now, he's dealing with everybody pre-flood, including Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Bad, 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 bad. Enoch, living in a bad time. The earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. This is what sin does, spreads like a cancer. And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. I need to speed up. So Noah, make yourself a boat. Now I just want you to imagine that process for a moment. Noah, make yourself a boat. Noah has probably never seen rain. I say probably because it's possible, the, 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 the biblical account, but, but, but the reason I say that is because pre the flood, the, wa- the, the, the earth was being watered differently. I'm not even going to go into explaining it. You can go look into it. Differently, it was watered differently um, than, than, than rain. At least that's how it appears. So I say he had probably never seen rain before. If he had seen rain, he'd certainly never seen it to the level that God says, because God says, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. That's going to require a lot of water. So Noah, what I want you to do is I want you to build a boat. And the boat's big. You can look into that. It's big. It's going to take some time. Noah, build it. Because I'm I'm about to flood the earth. So he'd probably never seen rain. Noah had possibly never seen a boat. Like he's a long way from the ocean possibly he had never seen a boat. Now, did he travel down there and I'm not aware of it? It's possible. But he had possibly never seen a boat. And the boat that he now needs to build, according to God's instructions, is going to take a while to build, to the tune of about 120 years. And as he builds, we're going to be told by the New Testament authors that he's going to preach as he builds. Now, I want you to imagine that that task placed before him of building a boat of that size in a place that had possibly never seen rain, certainly never to this extent, in a place that was not known. It's not like you're sitting in your front yard drinking coffee and a boat cruises by. You don't see boats every day. You, in fact, probably have never seen one. And yet, crazy Noah's out there building a boat. And as he builds a boat, he's preaching. And what he's saying is, you need to repent. You need to turn because the wickedness in the land has risen up before God and he's holy and he's going to start over again. And so for 120 years, like you talk about faith being the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Noah hadn't seen any of this and yet he's building his boat, cutting down trees, putting them together, building the boat. 
Doing it, Hebrews tells us, in reverent fear, in awe, in wonder, in reverence, in humility. Understanding who it is that has spoken to him about these events and what it is that is coming. And so he's building the boat. 120 years, long time for him. An absolute millisecond in the mind of God building the boat. And as he builds the boat and it begins to take shape, imagine the people around him. The wickedness in the land has gotten to such a place it's unspeakable, the evil in the land. It's not like he's got people encouraging him and, oh, Noah, you're doing great. They're, they're, they're mocking him and they're belittling him. And, and he has become the laughing stock for 120 years. Jesus looks back on the event in Matthew 24 and he says they're, they're getting married and they're being given in marriage and they're having parties and they're dancing in the shadow of the ark. And then one day it starts to rain and it doesn't stop for a long time and Noah goes into the ark with his family and the door is closed and the torrential downpour of the wrath of God falls upon the world that he has made and everyone dies Now I need you to see here, and I think that the thrust from the genius of the preacher to the Hebrews falls here on this fact that we approach God by faith, yes and amen. We walk with God by faith, yes and amen. And we obey God by faith. There is a, no one can say, God, I have faith, but I'm just not going to build the boat. There is a marked obedience in, in the um, uh, in Noah's life, as he, as he obeys by faith, and certainly he approaches God by faith and walks with God by faith, but here the, the thrust kind of falls on his obedience. So Noah obeyed God by faith, but you must be clear that it was not his obedience ultimately that saved him. You see, when you start to read the Genesis account where we did, you might miss the previous verse, which said that in all the corruption of the land, uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Ask yourself, how do you find favor in the eyes of God? One biblical answer and only one. You ready? Grace. Grace. Noah's a bit of a disaster. You see that after you keep reading. He's not, he's, it's, it's not his righteousness and his obedience that he drums up inside of himself that makes God kind of wink at him and be like, you're not as bad as everybody else. Like you watch the way it plays out post-ark. He's as bad as everybody else. Why does God provide a way of salvation? Grace. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Noah is saved by grace. More specifically than that, Noah is saved by a boat. To which the Apostle Peter has informed a multitude of good comments and, and commentaries from great theologians, one of which is this. Christ Jesus is our ark now. Christ Jesus is our ark now. Big enough for the whole world, strong enough to withstand the shocks of life, the rising waters of death, and the upheavals of the last judgment. There is safety here in the Son of God, sent to be for us all the shelter, the salvation that we so desperately need. Our ark and safe passage through the waters of God's wrath and into the new world God has planned, from that ark we will emerge to inherit a new heaven and a new earth. How is Abel saved? How is Enoch saved? How is Noah saved? The same exact way as we are. By faith. By faith. By faith, not ultimately in the blood of a slain lamb, but rather in the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That's how. By faith, not ultimately in, in their ability or our ability to escape death, but rather by faith in the one that destroyed death. Not ultimately by faith in our obedience, in our efforts to obey God, but rather in the perfect life of Jesus Christ. By faith. Now listen, and we're done. 
The writer to the Hebrews means for his church to make it to the end in perseverance, to not shrink back and go back and be destroyed, but to make it to the end. And he tells them, you will make it to the end. You will persevere by faith, by faith. And so then, his instruction to them and to us, in order to persevere, with Old Testament saints as the illustration, in order to persevere, is we must live by faith. We must live by faith, which means you approach God on his terms by faith. You walk with God every morning to every evening when you fall asleep by faith, and you obey God. In that walking, you obey him by faith. You do the things he tells you to do by faith. They don't make sense. Doesn't matter. Do it by faith. If we had more time and we don't, we could go into the fact of how crazy this thing called um, following Jesus actually is. You think building a boat's crazy? Try following Jesus. Also crazy. Certainly from a lost and dying world who looks in upon us. It's crazy. Why aren't you high school, um, why aren't you uh, kids in high school who claim the name of Jesus? Why aren't you living like everybody else? It looks crazy. How come you aren't ripping off the, the, your boss um, like your coworkers are by just stealing time from the company? It's crazy. Why is it that you Christians don't do the things and live like the rest of the world? It's crazy. And the explanation of all of that, which of course implies that our lives ought to demand an explanation because we live so differently but the explanation of all of it is this is what it means to live by faith I walk by faith which is why I don't sleep around in high school I walk by faith which is why I don't badmouth my boss or steal money from the company by way of stealing money or stealing time I walk by faith which is why I spend my money the way that I do and worship the God that I do I walk by faith And so I think that the kind of the resounding drumbeat for us to ponder and then we're done is, is that Abel's faith made his life look different from everyone around him. Certainly Enoch, walking by faith. Like, Like there's a marked difference between Enoch and everybody else. Noah, marked difference between him and everybody else. What's the difference? Faith. Faith looking forward and trusting in the promises of God, which find all of their fullest fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we would be a church marked like that, that we would be a people marked like that. God, that from the youngest in this room who are looking to Jesus by faith to the oldest in this room who are looking to Jesus by faith, God, that our lives would be marked by a categorical difference than that of the world around us and that the difference would be faith in Christ. God, that we would be like these Hebrews that in the difficulty and the trials and the suffering and the afflictions that we would persevere to the end, not ultimately by grit, but by grace. Not faith in our own efforts, but faith that that, that looks to and trusts in Jesus Christ. So God, would you do that work to the end and would you hold us and keep us and not let go of us? We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.